You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 78. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. I'm so very excited about this episode today for a couple of reasons. The first is, as always, I get to share it with my patrons. I'm going to start calling them patrons. I started getting self-conscious because I was going against the grain, but they are patrons and I have them through Patreon, which is a website that helps me get small amounts of money each month from my patrons, my patrons on Patreon to pay for this podcast production. And I love doing it this way. I don't have to run ads. I don't have to not swear. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to have this content approved because it's approved by my community. And that means a lot to me. So thank you, patrons. If you would like to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and sign up today. My guest today is Gypsy Snyder. But before... I bring on Gypsy. I have another guest. Surprise! And I am so, so, so excited because this guest has been working for the past 10 years on an incredible project that I don't want anyone to sleep on because it is important. It is historical, especially if you're from the U.S. And I promised her two years ago that when she got it off the ground and running, I would do everything to help her out because I believe in this so much. So my super secret guest guest today (laughs) is Miss Veronica Blair. Hi. (laughs) Thank you for having me back on the Artist Athlete Podcast. I really, really appreciate it. And it's it's fun. I really enjoy it. So for the people who don't know, who haven't listened to episode 19, who are you? What do you do? Hi. Yes. Uh, I am an aerialist. I am an instructor. I teach workshops. And I currently work as aerial director for Celebrity Cruises Entertainment. And I hope to expand and do more of that. Uncle Junior Project. Yes. Tell me the about Uncle it. Junior Project, everyone, it's finally here. Yes. The Uncle Junior Project was created in 2010 to, I created it to amplify the voices of, of Black performers who were historically marginalized within the greater circus community. Just in simpler, in simpler terms, I knew of a lot of performers of African descent, but when I open a circus history book, when I go to these libraries at institutions, circus in- institutions, and this is a long time ago, guys, I would look in the books and I'd search for people that I knew that were pioneers in the circus industry, in the circus community, and I didn't see them. I couldn't find anything on them. So that's that's basically what I mean by saying that <laughs> Black performers who were You were like, fuck it, I'm going to go out and make my own. Yes. So I was just like, I'm going to just do this myself. And so the main objectives behind Uncle Junior Project, they're, they're very simple. It's to capture the stories in an interview-based documentary so that we could provide like firsthand accounts of the performers' experiences. So instead of waiting till they pass away, opening up a circus history book and reading about them, you actually can hear their stories firsthand. So that was the number one objective. Number two is to share these stories and make sure that they that their stories are permanently secured in the archives of American circus, of the American circus narrative, and not forgotten and in live and living color. And then number three is to spread awareness. The the history of not just black circus performers, but all circus performers that don't there there's there's not a video of them, their stories aren't documented, their work isn't widely seen. The, if we don't preserve these stories, if we don't document, we lose like little lights. We lose little lights of inspiration. And so you know, that's why the Uncle Junior Project has this focus and specifically on the Black circus community, because 
and doing this project, we, we spread awareness and let people know that, Hey, like actually we've been here. Mm -hmm. Um, people from the African diaspora have been in circus since there was circus in different ways. So we have, we have the, the all black sideshow bands. No, they weren't allowed to play in the tent, but they were really popular and spread ragtime music and jazz music throughout the country. They played black music. You did have some black people in the sideshow, but you also had some slaves that were sold into circus. And uh, you also had some people who were kidnapped and forced to perform in the circus. And you had some acts that had to take on a more exotic name, like Uncle Junior, who had to perform under the name Prince Bogino. And he was billed as an African prince, not a Southern black American guy. So while they, while people remember them for maybe having seen them perform live or maybe having worked with them, these stories aren't written down. There's no legacy. And so the Uncle Junior Project aims to spread awareness about the history of Blacks in the American circus and, and say, hey, we're here. We've been here. We're out here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love it. So have you been like going around and interviewing people? Oh my gosh, yes. Isn't it fun? <laughs> yeah, like it's so crazy how much technology has advanced. Like now I can just, I can like, have a Zoom chat and I can interview people and edit it if I want to into a documentary. But you know, 10 years ago, like I got a camera and I traveled around and then I, it got bigger and I got a, a director yeah. of photography and I got had a sound guy and did huge fundraisers to fund this project. And it was, it was a labor of like li literally and truly a labor of love because there were so many people involved. Okay. So actionable steps, people mm. go to unclejuniorproject.com. Is that right? Yes. You can go to www.unclejuniorproject.com. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> thanks for adding the www because I wasn't sure if I did it or not. So I'm glad that you clarified that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when the internet first came out and everything was like www, like they had to say that. So yes, you can go to the website, um, and that is where we will premiere the first documentary in our series on Onion Head, the clown from the hood of the Universal Circus. And then after that, we're going to release a documentary probably about every 21 days or every month, and you'll be able to go to the exhibit page, and you'll be able to watch a documentary on the artist that we are featuring for the month. You can also go to our Facebook page. We're posting daily African-American history tidbits circus history tidbits articles videos between the, the the website and the facebook page we got you covered that's awesome and is it free like all these documentaries you can just like go on and see them yes yes that oh, is that is so the cool. main like this this stuff can't be put in a book or put in a you know uh, an article online where you have to search for it and find it. This information needs to be bright. It needs to be bold and full color, you know, for everyone to see yes. and have access to free access to is, is very important. I mean, my audience obviously loves long form interviews with circus performers mm. because that's what this podcast is. So for sure, like if you like listening to the artist athlete podcast, like this is basically the same thing, but better because Veronica spent 10 years on it and it's video and it's interactive. It's so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> I'm a fan yeah. already. <laughs> and I feel like something that I love about the Uncle Junior Project is that, that aspect of history, mm. that you've really got this like respect and understanding because like circus, as much as we want it to, like doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? Like it mm. happens alongside of cultural shifts mm. and like what's going on in the world impacts what's going on on in the tent that's it you're exactly right it's just it's that it's it's cut and dry it's it's really that simple it's not difficult to understand that whatever is going on socially is is happening in the circus the circus is it's not very different yeah well i cannot wait uncle is the place Yes. Now is the time. Mm. 
Veronica Blair is the woman behind all of it. Thank you so much for <laughs> coming on, for letting me like ask you about it. Yes. Because I love it. Shannon, so for it. thank you so much. That was my mini interview with Veronica Blair. Seriously, y'all. Go to UncleJuniorProject.com and it's Junior is just J-R. It's not the whole word spelled out. UncleJuniorProject.com is the place. It is for free, but of course you can donate to the cause. So like, hit pause on this interview. It's not going anywhere. Go check that out. Watch the four minute documentary on Onion Head. It's so heartwarming. And then come back and we'll start our interview with Gypsy Snyder. I'll wait. Welcome back. I hope you also subscribed to the Uncle Junior mailing list so you can watch the next documentary when it comes out too, right? You did that too, right? Oh, oh, okay. Go back and do that. I'll pause. I'll wait. My guest today is Gypsy Snyder. Gypsy was born and raised in San Francisco, California. She began her circus career at the age of four when her parents founded the Pickle Family Circus. She is a co-founder and artistic director of the Seven Fingers Circus Company, based in Montreal, Quebec. That's a Canada. Gypsy wrote and directed Sisters, Reversible, Intersection, Amuse, Undia, Traces, and Loft. Gypsy has choreographed televised feature performances for America's Got Talent, Her Majesty's Royal Variety Performance, The Illusionist Darcy Oak's Edge of Reality, and several large-scale fashion shows for Bench in the Philippines. In 2013, working with director Diane Paulus on a new vision of Pippin, she choreographed and wove circus into the revival of the Broadway musical. Gypsy's work on Pippin earned her a Drama Desk Award and an Outer Critics Circle Award. Gypsy became a Canadian citizen in 2018. She is also a guest teacher and guest director at the National Circus School of Montreal. In 2015, she received the Evolving Critics Award in New York City presented by Diane Paulus. She was invited to speak at the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C. in 2017 on the evolution of circus arts in the United States. Here's part one of my interview with Gypsy Snyder. I'm going to start recording. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Gypsy Snyder, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. I can't believe I'm saying this either. Shannon McKenna, hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I didn't know you knew who I was. And then I was wow. reading the correspondence from Hannah and I was like, oh my God, she's listened to the podcast. <gasps> what did I say? Did I mess something up? Ah. Not at all. The first time that I listened to the podcast was via Joel Baker. And so then I, I obviously had the podcast on my thing and I love listening to podcasts. So that was the beginning. Oh, awesome. What are some of your other favorite podcasts? Um, let's see. I out in the world of podcasts, I would say my or in your podcasts. Oh, well, now I want to know both out in the world of podcasts. <laughs> uh, I would say my favorite, uh, absolute favorite is John Green, Anthropocene Reviewed. Okay. I haven't heard of this one. Oh my goodness. That is hands down my absolute favorite one since Shit Town, which was used to be my favorite one. John Green, Anthropocene Reviewed. The human condition rated on a five star scale. Oh my God. All right. Well, I'm going to check it out on my run today. That sounds yeah. great. I mean, John, John Green is an of himself just an incredibly brilliant writer. People mostly know him for The Faults in Our Stars, but he also does an online crash course uh, for you know, sort of teen high school students that my kids just adored, that I adored. And that that was my introduction to him, not even The Faults in Our Stars, which is obviously deals with cancer in um, younger people, which was actually very difficult for me to read. And I didn't finish it, 
nor did I finish the film because I was dealing with cancer at the time when the book came out. But he, he deals with pathos in just the most beautiful, comical, witty way. And so I adore him. Awesome. Wow, cool. Well, I'm so glad that we've started off this interview with cancer. Um, <laughs> you know, keeping it light, keeping it light. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I always ask guests after the cancer talk and, you know, about their favorite writers and podcasts and everything mm -hmm. um, to talk a little bit in their own words about who they are and what they do. Because I always find that my, like, it's not enough to just say they're the artistic director of the Seven Fingers, because mm -hmm. what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. So who are you, Gypsy? What do you do? Who am I? Uh, who am I? I think that's sort of the eternal question. I can't believe that I've just turned 50 and I'm still asking that question to myself. Although I, I feel much more grounded as a 50-year-old woman than I have throughout my whole life, uh, which is very exciting. But who am I? Right now, what I am is the co-founder and co-artistic director of The Seven Fingers, which is a contemporary circus company in Montreal that does international work, very diversified. It is mostly a contemporary circus company, but we do a lot of production work. We work in musical theater. Uh, we've been doing more uh, dance and visual work, uh, audio visual work, and as well, how to say this, underground kind of experiential work, I think is also very exciting to us. So that's me within the context of the seven fingers. I am first and foremost, I would say a director slash circus choreographer or physical theater choreographer, you know, saying physical theater choreography is sort of a way or circus choreography is a way to say I do much less sort of the five, six, seven, eight style dance choreography, even though I do have a background in dance and physical theater, the my the construction is very different. Obviously, the composition and construction is very different. Beyond that, I am a mother of two teenage daughters, and I am an immigrant in the sense that I have immigrated to Canada and finally now have my citizenship. I am a cancer survivor. I am a feminist basically I would say I'm bordering on a socialist. <laughs> Let's go for socialist Democrat if we must. Yeah. I'm here for that. Hmm. I love a good dose of socialism, especially right now. Yeah. I feel yeah, like it's winning. It is definitely winning. I think that unfortunately capitalists don't recognize in which way it's winning, but it became very clear to me. You know, I left, the United States, sort of like a bat out of hell in 1989, just or 1988, just after graduating high school. And sort of since then have only lived in predominantly socialist countries. The reason I was going to all these countries was for art. And then you realize, oh, I'm going to these countries because art is actually a valued sector of society. And mm -hmm. not just a form of entertainment or something that you have to be really good at to make any money doing. So, you know, when I started to really understand that that was the pull that I was feeling from all these countries was that the work was valued and that there was actually an infrastructure to develop good work. Yeah. Then I, then I was pretty much, yeah, that that's where the, the deeper understanding of how a socialist democracy can work. Your like socialist bent or leanings, do you approach your directing that way as well? I do. Definitely a Gen Xer in the sense of I come from a really kind of hardcore work ethic. And I'm also very much was raised very much in the kind of like shut up and do it world, <laughs> which is sort of very opposite of kind of what I'm saying or what I'd like to portray in my work. So it's a constant balance between, yeah, there's a constant balance between put your ego aside and, and be, don't be afraid to sweat to get the results that we're trying to get, to just put in the hard work. But at the same time, I very much am trying to create a space within which every person in the room has a creative voice and impact on the project. I'm very much a, a driven leader and choreographer and I, and I have a vision, but the vision 
is englobes a certain sense of yeah, the community within it. I I like to think that I have a vision for a project, but ideally in the end, the result of the project will be utterly, hopefully surprising to me. Hmm. And ideally surpass any of my, yeah, surpass any of my wildest dreams. And do you have a formula for doing that? Or is it a little different every time you enter the rehearsal space or enter a new project? I absolutely want each process to be different and to be approached differently and unique to the actual work. However, I would say more than a formula, I would say I have a toolbox. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of tools that I pull on. and, And why I like to think of it as tools is like you can sort of take out this structure from when I did a a musical, I use this. And if I use this tool, I, but in this situation, you know, it it has a different impact. Whereas I feel like when you're, when you're trying to fill out a formula, you set yourself up for failure or you set your, Hmm. not, we can talk about the word failure later, but you set yourself up for a trap because the formula sort of implies that you do one step and it'll lead you to the next step. And then what happens if that next step doesn't come or doesn't come and fit into that um, box? So Ah. I'd say the only, the only real formula I use, which I would more call a structure or a skeleton is that I prefer to have something and make it better than to dwell in the unconcrete realm. So very often creators will go like, oh, let's try this. And then, oh, and then let's try this. And then I'll say, we're trying this, but more we're doing this. And we're going to keep doing this until it becomes something else. And that's a difficult concept for people to have, but I will just start a choreography and start building on it. And then I can see what's working or not working. And then in, instead of changing it, it evolves. So this might just be semantics for some people, but for me, it's a very, very important vantage point in the sense of my goal is to create something and you always have something. And instead of saying, oh, I don't like it, I'm going to change it. I'm going to say, okay, where has this brought me? And if I am not there where I want to be, or if I believe I can go further, it evolves as opposed to, oh, it's not good. Scrap it. Start again. It sounds like it's kind of like creator versus editor. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that's a little simplistic, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the creator is always making and the editor is kind of refining. And it sounds like your process is very much like make the thing, make the thing, make the thing, make it into something instead of like whittle it down to something. Yeah, I'm not quite sure because I think what I'm the message I'm trying to relay with this is that a lot of people I know, especially in circus, get stuck in a very vague world. And Mm. then, oh, shit, we have to make it concrete. So then they fix all this stuff that is not connected to the vague creative world. And so I prefer to really dive into here's an image let's do it like let's make it and then at the end of the day we can kind of go oh my god we have this this is now in our pocket it becomes a tool that will then evolve where I think a lot of people get stuck in the theoretical in the through the creative process does that make sense can you give an example of a specific time you might have employed this approach um I would say pretty much every production I would, so I have, you know, whatever ideas that are, you know, the the fantasy of what this thing is going to be or what it's about or whatever thematics, or maybe it's a script that already exists. Sure. And then also I'm thinking like queen of the night, maybe. Perfect. Like, uh, we can use yeah. queen of the night. Example, although it was Shana Carroll who directed, who wrote and directed that. <laughs> but I, it's actually sometimes more fun to look at the work of another finger, especially Shana, because we're 
sort of these weird, yeah, we, we, we've been living this parallel life, but so intertwined. So mm. her work on Queen of the Night, there you've got a script, which is um, the magic flute, in the sense of it's not a script as in text, although there is some text within the opera that was then implemented into this more physical theater circus piece. So she's going to take themes and images and structure from the story And then she's going to cast around dynamic of a performer and the dynamic of the discipline that they do to then improvise on those themes. And this is, this is basically the structure I would have used too. So then there's a long period of improvisation with those performers to really develop the character, the intention and the movement quality and how it relates to the tricks that we're actually have as our circus vocabulary. And so you're in that improvisation world and then you're sort of taking notes of like, okay, well, these are the, I've already created my structure. I know based on the script what that structure is and I, and I know what the disciplines are. And now I know these, the, these character development is happening. Now I, I sit down and I map out from all that information, real concrete choreography and structure and start placing it. So, you know, the improvisation thing will probably go on. Let's say if we have a three month rehearsal period, which is a luxury, we're going to say the first two weeks is improv on the theme. Then you go into the concrete, you start structuring the choreography. And if there's tricks that are not able to be implemented into that choreography yet, because it just takes more training in the afternoon evenings is when the pure training to, to connect the choreography and the technique together. So we're very, we always allow for that improvisation period, which is where people grow into the character, where we get to know the performer, we get to know how far we can push them in their movement and character quality. But very quickly, we get into, all right, take that essence and put that into something concrete, build it, and, and then it will evolve from there. Oddly enough, the fact that you picked Queen of the Night and because it is based on the magic flute, it's a little bit easier because there's the structure of a story and it's very clear what needs to happen from beginning to end, which makes this whole concept of staying in the concrete world of work, just like putting it out every day and then making it better. I would say more likely for traces, for example, that Shane and I did together, I wanted the opening number to feel like an automobile accident. It was called car crash. So we did quite a few improvisations on a certain amount of images that are relative to a car accident that I had, which is sort of tumbling, you know, being slammed into surfaces and the image of realizing like when you kind of come to and you sort of see the destruction of the car crash, the, essence of wanting to help someone out of it or to help yourself out of it the abandon that happens in a moment there's like there's a feeling of holding on we can make this work to a feeling of oh my god I'm giving myself into the the violence of it obviously the fear and the slow motion versus the high speed action film of it like we had all I just detailed all of those different elements Then we improvised on it. And then very quickly, I have to say, okay, well, this could become something. This this style of movement here. And then just started building. And of course, then it looked really stupid. (laughs) But then once it was concrete, we could make it look as magical as the improvisations felt. So I just think- And does concrete mean that you set it? Like it's no longer improvised, it's actual set choreography that's repeatable? set and repeatable. And then over time, it's, you can add layers and complexities and acrobatic levels to it. But if I had just stayed in like this, you know, the first improvisations were so cool. But if I don't get down into the nitty gritty and really just build it, then it it never becomes a reality. I'm interested because you, I mean, you are a director and you sound very much like a director, like a theater director. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested as to why circus, and I know a bit of your past, so this is kind of a leading question, but maybe not. Why circus is the medium that you choose to create in? Um, Circus is just absolutely 
my soul. I, I don't, I, hmm. I, it's my, my, it's part of my vocabulary, but it's also part of my family. It's part of my heritage. It's, it's a, you know, circus as an art form is also, I'd say a little bit more than other art forms. It's more a lifestyle because you, I grew up living in a, in a camper van trailer with my parents and, and the lifestyle of traveling and getting up and setting up the show and, and performing and tearing it down was something that was like, you know, it, it, with your family to, to live that with your family is you can't separate yourself from it. It becomes part of your DNA. So growing up with the pickle family circus and my parents who founded the company, I, a great deal of my childhood was spent fantasizing about what else I'd want to do, you know, cause you sort of rebel from your parents and think about, you know, creating your own life. And oddly mm-hmm. enough, I didn't really want to go that far away. I was in love with theater. I studied at the American Conservatory Youth Program in San Francisco. I went to Urban High School, which had an incredible theater department at the time. And I was a total like musical fanatic. I was a Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, you know, just obsessed with watching videos. I, um, Shakespeare, my brother and I were obsessed with Shakespeare at a very young age. We, we saw the comedy of errors when we were quite young at the Mount, uh, the Shakespeare and company in the Berkshires, and then proceeded to just read Shakespeare to each other throughout our childhood. Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And it was crazy to read Shakespeare and to feel that we completely understood the language was, um, was just a very cool and intimate experience with my brother. What's your favorite Shakespeare play? Yeah, I do. And my teenagers just all came home one second. Laska Galia. I'm in a meeting on the, so you have to kind of be a little bit quiet. Is that okay? Thanks. Um, Thanks Laska and Galia. (laughs) What is my favorite Shakespeare? I think the easy answer would definitely be Romeo and Juliet. But then I think, you know, just in terms of just absolute perfection in structure and storytelling and the perfect balance between sort of actual real playfulness and the excitement of just what love is and friendship. And yeah, I would have to say that's my first easy choice. But then I think my real, my real passion would probably have to be Hamlet, especially Ophelia within that piece and then in terms of just straight up comedy just because it was the first one that I ever saw and my brother and I just lost our minds loving it and I'm talking like I'm 12 and he's like six or something um (laughs) was was comedy of errors just that sort of it's like so much slaps it it you know it's not written physically but it just has so much um physicality and slap it's like it's like the first monty python i don't know it's got it's got all the politics but all of the situational comedy that you could ever hope for so you studied theater all through high school and and then did you go to switzerland for college yeah i read your wikipedia page right before we got on this call um (laughs) yeah i still was struggling i i I wasn't really a hundred percent ready to leave circus for theater. Uh-huh. I, I was already starting to direct and sort of teach circus in high school. And then I knew I wanted to get to Europe. So I basically got a job as a nanny in England, believe it or not, which at the time was my ticket out of, out of hell. I get my, t- you know, ticket out of the United States, got to London and was working for a family that was actually affiliated with the Pickle Family Circus, was on the board of directors of the Pickle Family Circus. And so I was helping them make a transition to moving to London. And consequently, they really sort of supporting my excitement for theater took me to see tons of plays in London and the Royal Ballet. And I, you know, I think my my mind exploded. I was only there for seven or eight months, but all of a sudden I was like moving to Europe and seeing the cultural world over there was just 
yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever known since the thrill of just finding yourself on another planet with so much. I mean, just, I would just wanted more every single day. And during my time with them, I took a train to Switzerland to audition for a physical theater school in the South of Switzerland that was founded by and run by a very famous clown named Dimitri, who mostly became famous in Switzerland um, through his work at Circus Knie. And then, but he was also just fascinated with theater, physical theater, music, dance, um, ballet. And so he opened a school that was not a clown school, it was specifically a, a school where he offered a very large curriculum. Um, and then y- if you wanted to be a clown, you had access to all these incredible tools for music, for dance, for comedy. We had folk dance, tap dance, tango, classical ballet throughout the three years was incredibly strict. Improvisation, mask making, commedia dell'arte, um, text work, and you could, you know, you could do text work in Italian, German, or French. I played Roxanne in in Cyrano de Bergerac in German in my third year. It was such... This doesn't sound like a real place. <laughs> this sounds like a dream. It really was a dream. It, it still exists. It's a, it's a certified okay. uh, physical theater school in the south of Switzerland. You live in a tiny, tiny village surrounded by mountains. The whole school is built up of these, like, you know, old stone buildings. I mean, there's a few buildings that are sort of new structures and studios and um, you had music training. We had just everything. In fact, if, if I had one negative thing to say about the school was that we, ha- we, you were able, you were required to take so many diverse classes that it was difficult to get really good at one thing. Hmm. That, that said, it, unlike, it was just perfect for me because I, I knew I wanted to direct and it was really gave me access to incredible teachers in voice training in you know, text, traditional classical theater training, you know, to, to magic classes. At one point I was, I got to take like a two month course in magic. <laughs> like no, Not that I cool. really wanted to do magic, but I had an incredible magic teacher so it was really the perfect place for me. I do think it's difficult for some students to really get good at any one thing. And then you get overwhelmed by a lot of things. And it's difficult to put something together that is quality because you're, you're quite spread thin. But as a director, it was the perfect place to be. And I, when I graduated, then I came back to the United States and worked at Circus Flora for a year before then returning to Switzerland to be in Dimitri's company for three years. So I really got to follow through with his whole methodology of this, you know, mixed discipline physical theater that he was so famous for. It's interesting that you say that uh, as a director, this variety is really good for you. For performers and when you're hiring or looking or advising aspiring artists, do you think it's better to be well-rounded or a master in one discipline? (laughs) Both, unfortunately. Oh, cool. Okay, great. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, I think that it's really, really important to identify with one thing that you can really take far. I think it's really important to get really good at one thing because the evolutionary process of diving deeper into something when it gets difficult, when you hit a wall, but you need to go further. If you don't have that experience in your career, you're always going to be sort of a, a surface person. Um, Mm. And, you know, in the end for me, I knew, As a performer, I I really had a strength in character, acting, physical theater on stage. But my discipline as an acrobat, as a circus performer, was never going to achieve the goal that I wanted to. I, I just knew I was never my body type my patience for the physical work that needed to happen. And I, I don't think I had enough of a natural capacity um, to push through. So I knew from a really early age that I was going to need to 
push everything through the directing. And I do think if you What was are- your discipline? Sorry to interrupt. No, it's all good. Um, I fluctuated between hand to hand as a porter and juggling. My parents were jugglers, but I sort of started with my dad throwing me around. And then at about 14 or 15, I started throwing around a, a young woman that I worked with for many years. So juggling was something that just was very natural for me. My parents did it. I performed it a lot. I I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the kind of theatricality that I could have behind it. I did a lot of passing because my parents had a comedy passing act. I really enjoyed Mm -hmm. connecting with other people, other jugglers around the world and passing and um, ended up performing quite a bit of passing numbers in my day. But hand to hand was... And is still one of my favorite disciplines in circus when done well. I worked with, actually over my career, had three different flyers and just really enjoyed sort of the strength and the connectivity that for me, that required, you know, required in that discipline that just physically I really enjoyed it, but also clearly choreographically, it's just so much fun and theatrically the relationship and the codependence is just really beautiful and and fun to play with so those are my two disciplines hand-to-hand and um, juggling i'm sorry i totally interrupted your I answer you about um <laughs> oh, well, so, yeah, between- being a i guess a generalist versus um having like a, a discipline okay. a focused discipline so for um, the seven fingers i mean i can just say yeah. right away we're really only interested in working with performers that can bring theatrical um, skill and personality as well as movement quality and presence to the work. So those are two skills that actually need to be worked. It's not, you know, I think there are people who have sort of natural, incredible presence and interpretive skills and movement skills, but it, you know, obviously you can bring that natural um, talent to the work, but if you're not able to say, oh, the director is, is trying to achieve something that is beyond what comes naturally to me, I need to have the tools to be able to push that further. And we, we direct, I think, especially Shana and I um, direct in a very sort of pedagogic way as well. We're really trying to push and mold and get things out of people, but you do need a base understanding of, theatricality and musicality and physical movement dance skills. Then of course, all of our shows, because we really want, um, we have, you know, a a relatively small ensemble. The idea is that you would also be not just performing your number, but that you are performing throughout. And whether that means you're needing to also do group acrobatics or group hula hoop. You have to be able to lend yourself to the disciplines that are being explored in the show. And that requires having other, other skills. You know, I'm not saying that necessarily every acrobat should know how to juggle or every acrobat should know how to do a handstand or every aerialist should know how to do a handstand or juggle, but it definitely for me, if you want to be a circus performer, like if you were a dancer and you needed to have a, you know, a certain amount of hours of folk dance or tap or whatever, just sort of an understanding of what these dis- different disciplines do to the form, I think that's sure. uh, very, very true for circus as well. That was part one of my interview with Gypsy Snyder. I know it's kind of an awkward place to cut it, but Gypsy and I, as you can already hear, are kind of all over the place. We're not working sequentially through her life, as I like to do in some interviews, but I just had too many questions to do that with her. So um, I cut it there. Next week, we'll pick up right where we left off. I'll do a little intro for you. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast. So a couple of things that... I picked up from this interview and actually really helped me in the weeks afterwards. Right after this, I wound up choreographing a piece um, for a little cabaret that I did in Chicago. And I noticed that I was kind of getting into this realm of unconcrete, is what Gypsy calls it, or I was really 
interested in these ideas and I realized that I didn't have a lot of time and I just needed to get something down. And it reminded me of when Gypsy says that she prefers to have something and then make it better than to dwell in this kind of conceptual or unconcretized realm. She has the patience to let something evolve when she's not satisfied with it. And this is what I did with this piece. I kept thinking, oh, man, maybe I don't like this here. Maybe I don't like that there. And it was like, it doesn't matter. Get something down and then figure out how to make it better. Because if you just throw it away or you get stuck in the nonspecific or the theoretical, then you don't really have anything to work with. And this is something that um, I really love about how Gypsy talks about the work is that it is work and that she's, she's always in this course of discovery in her work. I thought that was really cool and really valuable and kind of also led into this idea that we started to talk about at the end and we'll pick up with next week. But when I asked her about if it's better to be a generalist or to have a lot of skills or to be very, very good at one discipline in circus, that's kind of an ongoing debate. And she, of course, said it's important to have a wide range of skills. The more skills you have, the more you can do with. But that there's something about the fortitude and the tenacity that you build when you are able to push through those walls and those hard places and really develop mastery. And the importance of that is almost as important as whatever you're developing the mastery of. And one of the first things we talked about in this interview, and I don't want to let it lie because I think it's an important note, especially if you're in the U.S., one of the reasons Gypsy came to Canada and one of the reasons I'm in Canada now is because of the support for the arts that a socialist economy, a socialist government affords you when you don't have to struggle for health care, when you feel safe in your community, when there is funding and grants available through different government organizations or non-government organizations, it's a lot easier to create what you want to create. And my suggestion for that is not that everybody in the U.S. move to Canada. It's really cold up here and there are bears, so I don't recommend, it's not for everyone. But my recommendation is that you get very educated on the policies that the representatives in your area stand for. And you vote for the people who align with your policies. And if you don't see a policy, if you don't see that one of your representatives or someone running in your area is representing a policy, maybe like, I don't know, defunding um, the police and funding the arts, um, that would be a great thing to write your representative about. You can use the Postal Service. We'll talk more about the Postal Service next week. To learn more about Gypsy's circus company, The Seven Fingers, you can go to sevenfingers.com, and that's the numerical number, seven, uh, fingers.com. They are also on Instagram. The seven, again, that's the numerical digit seven, the seven fingers on Instagram, and they're on Facebook, the seven fingers. For aerial training tips and inspiration, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. I'm on Facebook, the artist athlete, and my website is theartistathlete.com. And if you love what you're listening to, you want to throw me a few bones for it. I always appreciate it. Patreon.com slash The Artist Athlete is the place to go. Subscribe to the podcast, rate and review. And part two of my interview with Gypsy Snyder will come at you next week, friends, fans, and enemies. Talk at you then. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. 
Hi everyone, this is Allie Cooper, owner and coach at the Radical Movement Factory in Santa Cruz, California. I love supporting the Artist Athlete Podcast and the amazing community Shannon has created here. I teach rope and fabric and have a circus conditioning app available on iTunes called Cirque Plus. You can follow me on Instagram at Allie Cooper underscore. And if you find yourself in California, come say hi. Hi, I'm Leah. I hate conditioning. So I created the ABCs of Fitness, a fun, full program of active flexibility, body weight, and cardio with personal daily check-ins to motivate you wherever you are and whatever discipline you do. Join our next 19-day check-in challenge and slide into my DMs on Instagram at ABCs of Fitness. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in this city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we got a place for you.